The election is a baffling process, and it will culminate in one final twist on election day when the American people will not in fact be voting in a straight popularity contest. Instead, the result is decided via a system known as the Electoral College, which has nothing to do with education and is not even a real place. What it is, is a way of breaking up voter representation by state. But each state is not equal. The number of electors per state is roughly proportional to the population in that state. And it's the reason why the election every four years is a battle to win just a few key parts of the country. The names Hillary Clinton and Donald Trump will appear on the ballot, but Americans are technically choosing from a slate of what are known as electors. They're real people who will cast their state's votes in the Electoral College according to the way their fellow citizens have voted. Each party picks its own electors, and each state's number of electors is equal to the number of lawmakers it has in the House of Representatives and the Senate in Washington. So Florida, for example, has 29 electors. All told, they add up to a total of 538. To get to the White House, the winning candidate needs a majority of those votes. And that's why the all-important number on election night is 270. Now, most states have a winner-takes-all system, with the winner of the popular vote in that state getting every one of its electors. But there are two exceptions, Nebraska and Maine, which allocate one vote to the winner of each congressional district, plus two other votes for the winner of the state as a whole. The two biggest chunks of the vote come from California, which is solidly Democratic, and Texas, which is usually reliably Republican, though this year it's looking a bit different. All the focus on election night is on the vote-heavy swing states that could go either way, such as Florida, North Carolina and Ohio. So why do it via the Electoral College? It was the result of a compromise way back at the Constitutional Convention in Philadelphia in 1787, where the delegates could not agree on whether the president should be elected by Congress, governors, state legislatures, or directly by voters. It means victory on election day will not necessarily go to the candidate who gets the most votes. Just ask Al Gore. He won the popular vote in 2000, but lost the Electoral College to George W. Bush by 271 to 267. It's possible that neither candidate this year reaches 270. They could end up tied at 269-269, though that's never happened before. Or they could fall short because the Libertarian nominee Gary Johnson or the Independent Conservative Evan McMullen pick off a state such as Utah and its six electoral votes. In that event, the result would be as good as a win for Donald Trump because when neither candidate gets a majority, the election is decided in the House of Representatives and barring a wipeout for Republicans in the House, Trump's party will be in charge. Remember that these electors are people. In the past, some of them have even cast their votes for a candidate other than the party nominee to whom they've been pledged. There's a name for them, faithless electors. Since the creation of the Electoral College, 82 such electors have been unfaithful, including a Democrat in 2004 who mistakenly voted for John Kerry's running mate instead of John Kerry himself. Given that this election year has never ceased to amaze, you'd be a fool to rule out another last-minute surprise.